have significant decrease. Yeah. Significant decrease in the number of students. What do you think is the reason? What might be the reason? You think the students have been scared of by me? Yeah? It, yes? <laughs> she says, yeah. Scared of means frightened by my terminology. You think that's the reason? No? No? You don't think that is the reason? <laughs> oh, sweet. Okay, so um, what I wanted to do was to just in, um, finish up by introducing to you this CRISPR-Cas technology that has come up as a major technology in, in uh, the biotech area. And it's actually uh, covering just about all the eukaryotes uh, in terms of whichever ones need to be genetically modified. Now, when we do the recombinant DNA technology, um, we are generally introducing a new DNA, right? So, and you saw yesterday that um, for the golden rice, we had many different DNA sequences in that construct that was introduced into the plants. So, as a result, uh, there's a big debate, something relevant to you all, uh, with regards to the foreign DNA that is present in the, in the genetically modified organism, right? So that's the, that's the basis for the debate and that's the basis for discontent among pe amongst people um, that, you know, we should eat natural, we should not be playing God, we shouldn't be cutting DNA and modifying it and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in case of the CRISPR-Cas technology, what people are doing is basically going into the genome of the organism. So there's no new DNA that is being introduced, but instead you're just making some changes to the existing DNA of the organism. Is that part clear to everyone? So there is no foreign DNA being introduced, but we are going to make changes to our own cellular DNA that is present. So when I say our own, I'm talking if we had to do uh, genetic modification to human cells. But uh, as I said to you, this technology can be applied to uh, any organism. So um, as you can see here now, uh, in the past, uh, what Professor Perry showed you that, you know, that corn that you remember that we were, um, that we are now eating, it is nice cob, bhutta, the one we call bhutta, and we have many, many, um, um, what do you call them, the, the little um, kernels, exactly, thank you, <laughs> the kernels on, on it. So there's a lot of food on one corn, cob, right? But when we started out, it was really just, uh, just uh, a single or whatever couple layers of the cobs, uh, sorry, kernels that were on the cob. There wasn't that much food in there. So that's the kind of wild species that were present when humans began agriculture. Now, I don't know how many of you know about this, but as we were evolving, uh, first, we were also living a hunter-gathering -gather, type of um, lifestyle, which means that people were nomadic, they were roaming from place to place, they were hunting and eating animals, which they hunted, or they just picked the fruits or leaves or whatever else that they could think of for eating. But it's only when they, came, uh, when they settled on the banks of a river and thought that they could do agriculture, that's when actual the settlements started and people started doing agriculture. But during agriculture, they said, okay, um, these are the crops that we like to eat, but they don't seem to be yielding much food. So let us now breed and select. And what I mean by breeding is that you've all seen this, that when you grow a plant, um, as long as it has been fertilized by the pollen, all that yellow stuff that you see floating in the air that makes a sneeze and all, that's the pollen, that's the male uh, reproductive uh, sperm, or you can call that as an equivalent um, male sperm. 
and that is what fertilizes the ovary and then you get the seed formation. So the seeds are basically like little babies which will then grow into the plant. So they, wherever you could do, whichever plant could produce seeds by crossing, then uh, in the next generation of the plants you could actually select for traits that is higher yield, more kernels on the cob and so on. So they looked at individual plants, saw that you know there were these um, traits that they wanted and then they just took that plant and and uh, uh, collected seeds from that plant, left all the other plants, let's say it was corn, left the other plants, but that corn plant that showed a bigger cob with many kernels was selected. And then they started breeding that, that particular plant, collecting seeds from it, growing it, then again collecting seeds and so forth. Now think about that if they were growing thousands of plants and of that only one plant gave you that slightly bigger uh, cob with many kernels on it, then how could that have happened? So often that happened because a, a mutation happened in a gene which then led to a particular trait. So that was a spontaneous mutation without any interference, but it changed a trait, a characteristic, and then we selected that characteristic. But now, we have, I mean, there we were waiting for years to select characteristics, right? Even in traditional breeding, uh, we, uh, we don't wait for necessarily for mutations, but we are waiting for recombination and all that kind of stuff. So it takes a long time. But think about it that if you were able to know which genes were responsible for making that big um, kernel, uh, many kernels on the cob, then you can actually carry out that mutation precisely by yourself with human intervention. And that is what this CRISPR-Cas9 technology allows us to do, is to go precisely in a particular part of the genome, and genome is basically the whole of the DNA that is present in any organism, to go be able to go there precisely, cut, make a change, and lo and behold, you have the same kind of trait um, that you were waiting for the, for the spontaneous mutation to take place. And that would have taken a long time. So of course, you know, uh, scientists being scientists, they want to um, rush everything and do it as best as they can with um, the highest amount of productivity and with least amount of inputs. So the inputs, you know, you don't want too much fertilizer, you don't want too much um, water and all that for agriculture. But if you can increase your yield and the taste and the nutrition, then, um, then it's a win-win situation. So um, what we call this uh, technology in a, in a sort of a, uh, in a wider um, concept is genome editing. And editing, you all understand, just like we edit anything we write, somebody makes small corrections to it, small changes to it, because they think that is the best way to present a, a, a write-up. So here what we are doing is we are just editing the genome, which is present in the form of sequences of the bases that I uh, explained to you yesterday. And there are only those four bases, but they can occur in any combination and then that combination is really what spells out the protein sequence and carries the, the genetic information is, is now transferred to the proteins that then carry out the functions. So you can see here, precisely cutting the DNA. Now what is not being shown is that how is the DNA again resealed and, and how the changes happen. So let's say here, the nucleus will cut two of the bases out, but then the backbone has to be sealed, chemically uh, make it into one continuous thread rather than have a broken thread there. So for that, you need some protein that will, um, that will reseal the ends that where the cut has been made, and that is done by the organism's own DNA repair mechanism. Now when I say this, 
think of it this way that within your cells, sometimes changes will occur in the DNA. The DNA will get a break or something, but we don't, we are not so, um, we are not so exposed to, or rather, um, well, the word is that we are not so labile, we are not so um, prone to having genetic modifications within our cells. Generally, we, we are fine. And the reason for that is because our own systems have a mechanism to repair the DNA. So that repair mechanism comes in when, when it sees the cut and says, okay, let me just seal the ends and make it into one long thread. Okay? Yeah, yes. Yes. How does the change happen? Very, very good question. Excellent. So what happens here is that when you have actually made the cut and, and uh, oops, sorry. And um, um, the DNA repair mechanism, the DNA repair enzymes, they come in, they do not have very high fidelity. So they don't exactly repair by reading the other strand. Plus, this one is showing only one strand cut. The, uh, the, usually what will happen is, in this uh, technology, you will get a double-stranded cut. So those two bases are lost in a way. And then this repair enzyme comes in, and it may even just reseal the ends, so that you've lost those two bases. Or, if one strand didn't lose all the bases, then the enzyme will try to copy it, but it will often make some mistakes. So what happens is that in this region, you will end up having either a deletion of the bases or addition because of some of the um, non-fidelity mechanism that is there. It's a repair mechanism, but it makes mistakes. Or you could end up having where um, you could even replace a very large portion of the DNA with a new uh, portion of, uh, new sequence of the DNA. That becomes a little bit complicated for me to explain to you in this technology, but the idea, uh, but what the question you asked was a fantastic one. The idea is that you are, in this gene, you are basically making few changes that will actually lead to the loss of function in this gene, ultimately loss of function in the protein that it codes for. Very good, again. So I think you're trying to ask, um, how do you direct, first of all, the nucleus to that particular region? And then you're trying to say that the nucleus, the repair mechanism, ideally, should repair it such that it should reintroduce exactly the same basis. Yeah. Yes. Very nice, very, very good thought. Bear with me and I'm just coming to that to you, huh? You will really appreciate that. Okay, so you can see this is what I was meaning, that you could either lose a few bases, you may add a few bases, and the technology also allows you to actually replace a whole portion of um, the, the DNA with a new sequence and then Again, there is a repair mechanism which will, if you introduce this sequence, then in the second round of replication, uh, the second strand will actually mirror, have the, have the complementary basis to the sequence. This is where it becomes complicated and I can't uh, go into the details for you for the time that I have, but this means, the questions you are asking, means that you are understanding and it's actually raising these questions in your mind. But I have most of the answers for you. Okay, so in the genome editing tools or the technologies that we have right now, we are dependent on these sequence-specific nucleases. 
Something that I didn't tell you yesterday, remember I was telling you that in recombinant DNA technology you can cut the DNA with restriction endonucleases? They are the same idea. They are sequence-specific nucleases, which means that they record recognize specific DNA sequence in the genome and they will go and bind to that sequence. When they bind to that sequence, then something happens, which you will again, I'll, I'll explain as, as I go along, uh, that they are now activated to cut the DNA. So if we were not able to direct it to a specific region, uh, then we would be at a loss. Then we would just be generating random mutations. And after generating random mutations, we would be then selecting for something that out of the blue, without us knowing in which gene the mutation has happened, but we would just be selecting for the trait and then going back to the DNA. Here what we are doing is we are knowing the genome because we've sequenced all these genomes of different organisms. We pick out the gene of interest, we pick out the sequence of interest, and we say, hey, nucleus, I'm going to direct you um, together with the sequence that you recognize I'm then going to direct you to the, to the genome of the organism and ask you to make the cut. So there are a few different uh, nucleases that are doing this job, but clearly the one that has become very, very popular is the CRISPR-Cas uh, um, uh, CRISPR nuclease technology. So, what I now want you to appreciate, which I didn't say this yesterday to you, is that if we are not observing, looking, and thinking all the time, um, we would just be doing research for no good reason. Just for our understanding, that is the purpose initially, but look at what the research for increasing our understanding leads us to. So there were scientists who were studying um, bacteria and they were knowing that just like viruses that attack us, viruses also attack bacterial cells. And the bacteria, or bacterium singular, has its own immune mechanism. So you all know how vaccines work in our bodies. When you introduce an antigen, antigen is a protein or a portion of the protein of the pathogen that infects us. And that portion of the protein or the whole protein in, a, in, a, in, in, an, inactive, in an inactivated form is introduced in our system. Because it is inactivated, it does not create a disease or any problems to us. But what happens with this foreign protein, antigen that has come in, our immune system makes antibodies to bind to that antigen and destroy it. Get that part? Antibodies are also proteins, complex proteins, that will then bind and destroy that foreign uh, uh, material that has been introduced. So if we have antibodies floating in our system, when that virus again comes and attacks us, we already have antibodies that will just go and bind to that virus and inactivate it. Does that make sense? So if there was a vaccine for HIV, people, wherever there is a high incidence of HIV, people would be vaccinated against that virus they would have antibodies floating against that viral um, protein or antigen. And if they ever got infected with that virus, the antibodies will bind and destroy um, the virus. As a result, there will be no, no um, disease progression. Because the idea is if the virus establishes itself in, the, in our systems, then it multiplies and then it takes over. So we have an immune system. Just like that, bacteria has an immune system. Bacteria is going to fight the incoming organism. And what is it going to fight? The, the virus basically injects its DNA into the bacteria. 
and then that DNA will use the bacteria's um, machinery, cell machinery, to replicate itself, to make many copies of the virus. So that DNA has to be destroyed. So what scientists found when they were studying the bacterial genome, so this is part of the bacterial genome, okay, not the entire genome, just part of it. They came across a region where they found that there was a sequence that was repeated several times. And in between those repeat sequences were, were uh, unique se sequences, the spacer sequences. And when they asked the question, what are these spacer sequences? Lo and behold, those spa spacer sequences were of viruses, small sequence of DNA of the virus. So when the virus had attacked the first time the bacteria, the bacteria kept a small sequence of that virus, and maybe this is another sequence, that is another sequence of another virus, and so forth. So it, it actually made uh, 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 this, um, uh, kept this genetic information in its own genome to be able to recognize the second time the virus attacked itself. Okay. So, so much so for that spacer sequence that probably um, that um, uh, is the invading virus sequence, a small bit of the viral DNA sequence in the bacterial genome. Present also in the bacterial genome is this gas nuclease. This is that sequence-specific nuclease that will do the cutting job. In addition, you also have another piece of information in the bacterial genome which codes for an RNA. And you will see the, the beauty of this whole system in just a minute. Okay. Now this is a bit complicated, but I'll explain everything to you. So once again, this is your CAS DNA genetic information. This is that RNA information. This is all DNA, by the way. And here is your spacer, sorry, the repeat sequence and the spacer sequences. And it's a better depiction to show you that the spacer sequences are colored in different, um, they have different colors, indicating that they come from different origins. So one could be virus, one could be some another virus, the other one could be some other invading DNA. But the beauty is that this bacteria is able to keep a small amount of that genetic information. Now let's see how it uses this small amount of genetic information to kill the virus if it, if it comes the second time. So here is the virus. It's injecting its DNA into the bacterial cell. And now the idea is that this DNA has to be cut and destroyed, okay? If it has been cut in different places, destroyed, it can no longer replicate itself. And so you will not get many viral particles forming within the cell and destroying the cell. Here what happens is that um, by transcription, you will get this region transcribed into an RNA molecule, and this RNA is also transcribed. Interesting thing about this RNA is that it has a region that recognizes the, the, the repeat sequence here. You can see now that a portion of this is bound to that uh, black part in a double-stranded way. The, ba the base pairing is the reason for this double-stranded nature. And now what has happened is here's the protein that has been synthesized from here. And the protein, this nucleus, Cas9 nucleus, recognizes this uh, kind of, um, this kind of double-stranded RNA sequence. And now um, is ready, it, it's become activated, and it's now ready to be targeted in the region where you get this little sequence, it has been cut, as you can see, and this whole complex is now going with this portion, viral DNA sequence being single-stranded. This now is carried over to the viral DNA. Wherever this base pair complementarity is, is in the viral DNA, uh, which is sort of shown here to you, you can see that this sequence will base pair 
and now the nucleus is going to make the cut. So by actually choosing this sequence here and by whatever the, um, the, this complex here recognizes in the viral DNA, it goes to a specific region and makes the cut of the DNA. And you can see initially it's a single-stranded cut, but then afterwards it's a double-stranded cut. Now when the genome, coming back to, yes, So what I'm saying is that now you know the DNA, right, what it codes for. Basically this region is transcribed. This is also transcribed and translated. This is only transcribed because it does not code for any protein. So it's just transcribed into a RNA. This one is transcribed to a messenger RNA not being shown but then translated into a protein. This one here is just transcribed into an RNA, okay. Now, RNA molecules are single-stranded molecules. So, you get that part. Now, the nuclease pretty much recognizes a double-stranded structure. So, double-stranded means just like how DNA is, the two strands that are held together. So, RNA follows the same thing. If you give it a complementary sequence, then you will have a double-stranded RNA. Okay? So, it's just think of it the same thing, A will um, um, base pair with U in, instead of T because RNA does not contain T. So A will base pair with U, G will base pair with C and as a result you will get two RNA molecules coming together. Hmm? Now this track RNA, this RNA has complementarity to this um, repeat sequence that you are seeing in the black. So you can see now that the black sequence has now base paired with part of this RNA, the track RNA. So there's some conformational change of the RNA. You can see that it has a slightly different structure. But this part has base paired with the, uh, with the black part, which is the... So the, the, the information is there in that RNA to go and bind to the repeat sequence. But the specific sequence that is complementary to this viral DNA. This one is left uh, un unbase paired. As you can see, finally this is cut. This, um, this sort of structure is, is what the Cas9 will cut here. And ultimately you are left with this complex protein double-stranded RNA complex. So this is still Cas9. You see this very hazy this is Cas9 bound to this double RNA, double-stranded RNA. You see this? The double-stranded part is still there. It's just been cut from the rest of it. And the other portions are hanging around there. We are, not, we are just not showing them. They're there, but we are not showing you because uh, this is the part that we are interested in now. So this complex now goes and says, hey, I see some complementarity in this DNA, in the viral DNA, because this is viral DNA sequence, small amount of sequence. So it goes and starts to base pair. Now this viral DNA has been opened up and you're just, you're just being shown a small portion of the viral DNA where there is complementarity of this blue strand um, with the viral DNA. Do you get it now? It's just basically following wherever you have complementarity. It's just the, the sequence in these two molecules are coming together because of base pairing. This molecule is coming together with this one because of base pairing. And it's all complementary sequence. Complementary means that again you have the sequence that will base pair with the other molecule, the sequence in the other molecule. When this complex is formed, the nuclease will now make a double-stranded cleavage. So the sequence, you can see now how it has been directed 
this complex has been directed to a specific sequence in the viral DNA. And that's where it makes the cleavage. And if this cleavage happens a few times in the viral DNA, you will actually get this DNA now cut in fragments, and this DNA is no longer good for uh, making an infection in the bacterial cell. Now, the DNA repair mechanism does not work here because this is foreign DNA and the bacteria is trying to destroy this DNA. So it has managed to destroy by cutting it in several different places. Only one cut is being shown to you and uh, ultimately the, the virus cannot, cannot infect the cell. Do you get that? Yeah? Okay. Any other? Yes? That's really nice. Okay, so now um, what happens here that uh, it, this, this gives you a little bit more detail that if you are now going to use the, the basic information that um, I just described to you in the bacterial cell and going to say, okay, we are going to engineer this technology for our purposes. So, of course, we are not going to direct um, the, you know, the, we won't have the viral DNA there. What if we actually change that viral DNA in the, in the spacer region and the, um, uh, the spacer and the, and the repeat region? If we, we change that sequence to the genomic sequence where we want to go and make the cut. And that's really what the scientists have engineered. So in that, they have basically uh, cloned in this, in this uh, particular construct, the Cas9, you can see. And then you have the, the guide RNA, but then you also have that target region, which is coming from the, uh, from the genome of the organism that you want to target. So this sequence now will recognize the genomic sequence of uh, an eukaryote. DNA, and it will go and bind there, the RNA that will be formed, it will go and bind there. The Cas9, which will be translated into the protein, will again go and uh, um, go to the genomic region and make the cut just the way you saw it in the, in the uh, technology that I was presenting before. So the target is present immediately upstream of this, uh, um, of this region, and that's where um, the, the, the cut is, is going to be made. So let's look at this now here. Can't really see this very, very nicely from here. Okay. So um, you can now see that what's happening in the, in the genome. You can see the complex. This is the protein. 
the Cas9, that's your guide RNA that initially formed a double strand with the sequence which is the target sequence. So that sequence is then bringing us to the um, to this genomic sequence and positioning the nucleus in this region and this is where the cut will be made. Now once the cut has been made, the, this, these are the different parts in the DNA repair mechanism that can happen. Remember in the bacteria, I, was, I wasn't saying that very well, but in the bacteria we are not using a repair mechanism because the bacteria is destroying the viral DNA. Here what we are doing is we are targeting this technology to the genome, actual genome of the organism, whether it's human cells or, or plant cells or whatever. We've targeted the, the whole technology to a specific region and so the organism's own repair mechanism will work. And now you will see that because of this cut, you can end up having a small insertion or a small deletion in the sequence or if we actually did um, uh, introduce some hom homologous regions, also engineered them in this whole thing, then you would actually end up having homologous recombination and you can introduce uh, a big portion of, of DNA, of new DNA into this cut as well. So there are many ways you can actually manipulate the DNA, but you end up having a gene that is the organism's gene that you have changed by insertion or deletion most often. Forget that for a minute, but insertion or deletion. So you're not introducing a new gene from another organism. What you're doing is you're just mutating the gene of the organism. Now, the construct that, that is introduced, this gets diluted out in the next few generations. And as a result, what you're left with basically is a genetically modified organism which carries no foreign DNA. It carries the mutation, but it carries no foreign DNA. Therefore, it has different legal uh, implications than recombinant DNA technology. So just to show you that the CRISPR events um, since, uh, well, 2002 up to 2015, you can see what a big um, increase in the number of, of studies that have been reported. And just recently, there is the first clinical trial involving CRISPR uh, that has been uh, carried out by a Chinese scientist. And what they have basically done is that they have removed from the immune cells of humans, um, obviously these immune cells are present in the blood of, of a human, and a person with lung cancer. Now, these, the, the immune cells basically carry a, a gene called PD-1, which after a while stops your immune, suppresses your immune system. So they said, okay, if we mutated this gene, it will no longer suppress the immune system, and therefore the immune system will remain active, and it can actually um, target the cancer cells. So the immune system itself of the person will try to take care of the cancer cells by destroying them. But usually what happens during cancer is that any cancer cell uh, just takes over the organism and the immune system eventually, it outgrows the immune system and just um, doesn't let the immune system uh, do the job and then continues to grow. But here, if the immune system has been empowered, then your cancer cells can actually have a chance to be um, uh, killed or to be suppressed in their division. So this is happening right now as we talk, and there has, this CRISPR technology has been, has been used in um, mutating this gene in the immune cells, then the immune cells were reintroduced in the blood of the cancer patient, and I guess they're just waiting to see that there are no negative effects and that there are the positive effects that they are expecting. I won't go into this one. I will leave this for Mark to discuss. <laughs> you can see that how much, um, 
how much uh, fight over the CRISPR patent has happened because different scientists have been working on different aspects of it. And uh, this is where the, the, uh, the, the law aspect of it comes up. So when we are talking uh, GMOs, you can see that there's the history of the GMOs. You can also see uh, how many different plants now, probably more, even more, since I made this one. And uh, um, in one of the slides, you will see how, throughout the world uh, where which countries are actually growing most of the G, uh, genetically modified crop plants. So I said, I'm, you know, it's mainly happened in, 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 in plants, so this is why we often talk about uh, plants. BT, cotton, BT, maize and BT, whatever. Um, you all, again, should, should know that what does this BT stand for? And the BT is, is actually a bacillus thuringiensis. This is, this is the short form for, for, the, for the name of this bacterium. This bacterium is a pathogen on the insect that eats the crops. And the insects, if they wanted to, to just wipe out the crops by eating, they can do that. So you can just imagine what kind of, imagine what kind of losses the farmers suffer because of the pests. So one really wants to not use pesticide and contaminate the environment. So the scientists who were working on um, this bacterium infecting the, the grub, they found that the bacterium produces a toxin. There is a gene for that toxin and that toxin goes and binds in, the, in a receptor present in the gut, in the stomach of the pest, and then the, the pest is killed. The so pest just, you know, loses it and, and is, is killed because it's a toxin. So they took this toxin gene, or gene encoding for the toxin, and instead of um, the bacterium infecting the grub, they decided that what if we put the toxin gene in the plant? And if we put the toxin gene in the plant, when the grub eats the plant, it's going to die. And that's exactly what happens. So this is the beauty of science, is when you are studying any mechanisms, a phenomenon and mechanisms, suddenly you realize that you can actually use these mechanisms and um, use it for your own benefit. So I won't go into uh, the details of uh, the herbicide resistance, otherwise I'll end up taking just, just way too much time. But you can see that um, the future of GMOs, of course, we have many questions that need to be answered. And for all of them, we have, um, we have genetic engineering, including the genome editing tools as a solution. And of course, there will always be these ongoing debates that um, uh, Professor Perry and Saurabh and, and, uh, and uh, Professor Bharti will, will discuss. So we do have problems versus benefits also in using GMs. As you can see, the benefits on this side and the problems, and obviously, very often, you as lawyers will be concerned more with problems than with the benefits, the scientists and the the rest of the population will be concerned more with the benefits. <laughs> Anyways, so you see that safety is a big issue. Monocrops, as I was telling you about the bananas yesterday, um, shouldn't have one variety only because if something happens, then they, it can be wiped out completely. We should have as diverse as possible organisms, as diverse crop varieties, other organisms, um, so that we maintain that genetic diversity, so that we can fight pests and pathogens, we can fight um, the other kind of environmental stresses that are there. When we do have uh, these technologies, though, unfortunately, you do have the corporate monopolies. No wonder Monsanto has a very bad name. Um, but then, if people don't talk about that, they probably wouldn't do as many safety trials as they should be doing. And of course, then we do, um, in a big way, start depending on these technologies and so on. And then adventitious presence, uh, Professor Perry will, will discuss the, the problems there. 
This is just showing you the approved transgenic plant events from 1992 to 2016, the different crops, how many events have taken place. A lot has happened. We don't think about it in our day-to-day -day lives, but you can see many, many things are happening. And here is a picture showing you where in the world uh, we are using the, the genetically modified crops, hugely in North America, US and Canada. Um, and then you have also in South America, parts of Africa, but India, certainly China, and, and some bits of, of Australia. So I guess this is it, and I will stop here and take any questions if you have any further questions. But the questions that you did ask were very good. So did it make a little bit of sense? Now do you feel a little bit more empowered with the knowledge and understanding what is, what is genetically modified in biotech? Good. <laughs> so I will be here for the rest of the days. And if there are any questions, we can always discuss before or after the class or whenever you want to. OK? I'll stop here. So I hope everyone has um, a better idea of how the science is evolving. And tomorrow we will talk some more about um, uh, GM crops and their regulation and what some of the legal battles have been over the last few years. Um, but just now I want to uh, carry on where I left off yesterday and uh, have a look at some of, these, um, some of these areas where I've done a bit of research in modeling uh, regulation of genetically modified plants. So I guess you may have all heard that certainly in Europe there's been uh, a great deal of opposition to the uh, growing of genetically modified plants inside Europe. Well, some countries of Europe, some countries are more accepting than others. Um, although a number of crops have been approved through this kind of regulatory process by the European Union, most countries are not in their own jurisdictions um, engaging in uh, their production. So um, the French example is... Uh, uh, of particular interest because although, as I say, crops have been approved in Europe, the French government has taken a position of anti-GM uh, crop production and they have basically fought against both the European Court of Justice, the European Union uh, and even the French courts in terms of bringing in a number of regulations that prevent the production of GM crops in uh, France. So um, in Europe, and again I'll, I'll come back to this tomorrow, but just to give you a foreshadowing of it, uh, there is a requirement for labeling. Uh, so any product that is GM needs to be labeled, whereas in most markets in the world, a product, if it is an approved product, does not need to be labeled. So in North America, you'll not find products being labeled saying they have uh, GM content, or indeed um, in Australia. Occasionally, you'll find products that say no GMO on them, but that is not a, a mandatory labeling system. That's purely a voluntary uh, approach taken by 
people hoping to take advantage of a non-GM desired market. So that's quite an interesting uh, point too. In terms of uh, GM regulation, I think probably this slide is the most used for you in terms of a couple of jurisdictions around the world at least. There have been a number of different approaches in different jurisdictions of how genetically modified products would be uh, regulated. So there's this idea of substantial equivalence in the US. Um, so if your new product is substantially equivalent to an older product, uh, it needs very little in terms of approval. In the EU, it's dependent on the process which is used to make the product. And uh, at the moment, early days of CRISPR, it's hard to say whether uh, CRISPR will actually fall under or not these regulations. Uh, interestingly, and perhaps surprisingly, the Canadian system has quite a sensible approach in that they're looking at whether the organism itself is a novel organism, uh, irrespective of how the organism has been created. So, for example, if you create a new wheat or a new corn in Canada by mutagenesis, uh, which is an old technology uh, relying on random mutations, and then you just select the good product uh, that happens to turn up, that would be a novel plant in Canada, but it probably wouldn't attract regulation inside the EU or the US, um, uh, as it really is just uh, now kind of accepted as traditional breeding techniques. You're looking for random mutations uh, naturally occurring when you expose seeds to radiation or chemical mutagens. Uh, Australia, uh, at the moment, the uh, Office of the Gene Technology Regulator uh, is the government body that looks after um, regulating uh, all uh, GM and novel products. They look only to um, the definition of what's a genetically modified organism under the Act. And again, this is a little uncertain whether the CRISPR technologies would fall under that definition. So there has been some call for changes in the regulatory process and indeed the legislation to meet uh, these modern technologies. You'll find this, of course, uh, typically very often uh, when there's a modern technology that the, at least the regulations have to be adopted to meet the technology, if not the legislation, uh, which is unfortunate in a sense because, again, you're looking at a reactive form of uh, uh, legal regulation rather than a planned form. So um, if you're thinking about uh, the development of regulation, um, probably a good paper to see if you're interested in how these things are developed in, in, uh, in a long-term process in somewhere like Australia and typically other countries too is that they typically engage a uh, law reform commission or a special body to create a report. Um, they get a board of examiners almost together to draw up a report and consider submissions from the public to, as to how perhaps legislation should be altered to meet the new technologies. So, for example, in this one, the uh, gene uh, uh, patenting human health Australian law reform commission report they recommended uh, that there should not be uh, an exclusion of genetically uh, genetic materials uh, and technologies from patenting but as we mentioned yesterday this has effectively happened by the interpretation of the current law by the courts so you see the kind of uh, machinations and difficulties that our society has. On the one hand, you see, you see a law reform commission that uh, over a, a long period of time with many experts in the field accepted that genes were patentable and they said it shouldn't be changed. But then you have the high court, which is the top court in Australia, 
um, coming along and saying, no, they're actually not covered by patents anyway. So you see there's a, a, a kind of a dichotomy of approaches as to whether things are or are not patentable, depending on whether you come through the court system or through the regulatory examination system through the Law Reform Commission. So that's um, a difficult story. So these advisory committees, of course, as I say, are usually composed of a large number, 15, maybe 20 experts. Um, often uh, they are very good people, but they are chosen because of their connections rather than their expertise. So usually they have to satisfy the requirements for expertise, but you may find, you know, there are many experts in the field, but the people chosen are chosen because they are known to the political appointers of those committees rather than any other reason. The requirement for public comment, uh, usually several months uh, uh, a request goes out for public commentary into these commissions. And people nowadays are more vocal and they do post uh, responses to uh, queries for comments on uh, uh, prospective changes in the law. Of course, you will get the uh, almost by rote comments from extreme groups who are um, perhaps active in the area, such as anti-GMO groups, or indeed on the other side, industries who create GMOs uh, would be very keen to comment. In the uh, human uh, gene area, you would get uh, the medical profession commenting on one side, uh, people who create uh, uh, materials, uh, companies that is for medical use on the other side, and uh, perhaps religious groups at yet another side of the uh, spectrum. Of course, all these comments have to be read and uh, understood by the committees, so a lot of their work is in fact digesting public commentary. In terms of uh, statistical analysis of how representative that is of the public opinion, of course, is um, not often tested. So you can get a, a whole series of comments that seem to point in one way, but it may be that the general populace is thinking a different way, or they simply couldn't care. Um, so it's very difficult to uh, make any statistically based judgments on those kind of things. Committees usually have no power as such. They just make recommendations to the legislature as to uh, what should or should not be done. And often, of course, they don't have enough resources um, to deal with highly complex problems such as the you know, human jet genetic material. So um, they face, as I say, complex procedures, um, bureaucracy. Um, Australia is quite a uh, bureaucratic system in order to make any changes. Uh, timeline, time for dealing with complex problems is usually very short. And of course, their mandate um, is often restricted so that they can only look at certain specific questions rather than the whole gamut the whole breadth of the problems stated. If you want to uh, uh, apply to use uh, genetic materials in uh, the UK, this um, is a uh, uh, outline of the kind of processes you have to go through in order to get approval to do any activity in terms of human genes or uh, human genetic uh, uh, manipulation. It is obviously not a easy process to get through. And indeed, many researchers uh, 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 become very frustrated with having to deal with all of the number of steps you have to get through in order to try and um, engage in your science. So again, there's a large bureaucratic process before people can uh, engage in science. So um, that's something else you might want to ask yourselves. Do these processes actually provide uh, a barrier to risk? Are they purely bureaucratic for the sake of uh, bureaucracy? 
Uh, do they aid or hinder innovation? And these are some of the uh, ideas you may wish to wonder about in this realm. So um, in terms of regulatory approaches, you have to think that uh, uh, there's going to be a great deal of change as the tools get better with the introduction of tools like CRISPR, and this is probably only one of many to come over the next decade. How is the uh, regulatory system going to deal with these new uh, technologies? Is our policy and are our policy makers sufficiently informed to understand what is happening. You've all seen, probably most of you for the first time from Professor Krishna here, a brief and very simplified description of how the CRISPR technology works. And clearly it's not trivial. Understanding in any detail how that works would obviously take many, many hours of study and understanding. Most policy makers are not uh, uh, going to engage in that kind of activity in order to understand the technology. They probably uh, don't have the facility to understand it anyway. I'm being a little sarcastic here. <clears throat> so in terms of government regulation, just from a high view, um, you have to think of biotech, of course, is just one of the fields where government regulates. Um, there's science, there's public opinion, um, there are safety and risk issues, and of course, finally, there's the uh, uh, application of law, regulation, and policy to hopefully achieve good outcomes for everyone. So, of course, uh, uh, today our main thrust of our talk, although we are, of course, running behind time, but don't worry, uh, time is fungible. We just take more time um, and you get more to read on your own and I shall post some readings for you when I find a place where to post them uh, which I shall do tonight so um, indeed uh, this is a big change in itself the the fact that the uh, uh, myriad uh, human gene patents are now rejected from patenting that is going to make a huge difference to um, uh, patents in um, in the gene area across the board, not just human genome. So um, I created a little map doing a study on some stress, plant stress patents as it happens, as to who owns biotechnology patents. And in the main, most of them are owned by industry, some are owned by universities, a few by research institutions, and very, very few by hospital and government organizations. Um, most are owned by industry, and by that I mean private industry rather than government or university industries. This was uh, uh, in the US and the EU only, not global. Um, I also uh, made some maps uh, using some software that showed um, the relationship between companies and uh, the ownership of patents. And should you wish to uh, play with this software, you can. You can log on and play with it yourself. You can even upload, should you wish, your own tables and see uh, if you search some patents and put them in and work out what companies are owning which patents in which field. Um, and to do that, you just need to, uh, this is just an example of some of the relationships, Pioneer Hybrid, these are the number of patents they own, and these are the ones they co-own, where there's two companies and overlap at an edge there. Um, you can do this, just have a look at this website, patentomics.org, that I set up. Click on the link to the code site. You can log in using Mark, and Mark is the password and the username. And in order to uh, upload code, you'll probably need to read a book chapter um, which tells you what you have to do in order to uh, upload material. If you want to play with this and it's not clear here, just send me an email. I'll give you a, a card with my email address on it if you haven't got it already. Um, and I'll uh, uh, point you or send you the paper of how to play with the site. So um, something else, I'll post these tonight. There's a number of papers here. These are some of my papers in the biotech area that uh, you may or may not find interesting. 
Uh, here's some more. This is a, a, um, an Indian uh, paper that's in a book I edited last year uh, by one of your uh, alumni from this university, Sunisha Tripathi. Um, and I do recommend that you look at this one in particular, Biopatent Pooling and Policy on Health Information for Access to Medicines, and a very long title <laughs> for meeting your open minds. Um, you can find that on, if you can't find it online, um, I shall uh, give you a copy. Um, that's, um, that's where the book is. So, um, of course, uh, this really is the tail end of yesterday's talk. Um, those are some of my cows. Uh, <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> um, next is uh, more, um, but this is probably a good time to have a very quick break because I know some of you wish to have a glass of water or run away. <laughs> so just seven minutes and see you all back here. Canadian Supreme Court said that yes, it is true that anything made by man is po possibly patentable and that is why the definition of uh, invention is kept very broad by the legislator, but uh, it's still not without its limitations, okay? The definition of what is patentable invention still has its own limitations. If it was uh, so, so, so simple and clean uh, as the statement anything made by man is patentable if it was that way the case then legislature could have easily chosen that language rather than choosing the language manufacture etc uh, etc et machine manufacture composition of matter art process right so the fact that legislature chose all these complicated terms it means that legislature wanted certain limitations on what can be patented and what cannot be patented the job for the legislature and the courts would have been very easy if simply you would have said that anything made by man is patentable so you didn't say that it means you wanted certain limitations on uh, you know on what can be patented okay so therefore the court said that sorry an onco mouse a higher life form is not uh, covered by what is a patentable invention uh, under the uh, law. Uh, but then, uh, you know, because law is not stating it in that sense, therefore, and, and these are those problems which courts are, you know, facing a new, uh, and they're trying to make sense of it. Uh, they are getting influenced by the moral connotation of it. They are getting influenced by the scientific investment of effort, money, ingenu ingenuity in it. And therefore, they're trying to bring out a response which they think is the most coherent, which might not always be the case. So, for example, here also, uh, even if some of us feel comfortable with the fact that, okay, higher life forms are not allowed to be monopolized, yet in terms of logical consistency, the court, the majority was saying genetically altered egg may be patentable, but not the animal uh, which emerges out of that. That is surely not patentable. That was, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that is something which the minority opinion in this case highlighted. They said that we don't understand what is this subject matter which is there at one point of time and it is extinguishes at the other point of time, okay? If there is a patentable subject matter, then that stays patentable uh, always, right? So, so that is a slight bit of logical inconsistency, if we may say so, uh, like that which was present here. Anyhow, coming to our own equivalent of, yes. Uh, the, the, I mean, you have, to, you have to figure out what the logic is. They said that we appreciate that an egg can be called as a composition of matter or something like that, but uh, a fully developed organism develops through various complex, complex processual, you know, this thing, right? There, human being doesn't really have an intervention, okay? So when an egg gets converted into a fully formed life form, that conversion, a human being doesn't really, you know, uh, uh, intervene in, right? No, it's not. We are, we are talking about the subject matter part of it. Yeah, the subject matter, whether it is a protectable subject matter or not, okay? So the court said no. Anyhow, coming to... Uh, a sort of an Indian equivalent of uh, life versus no life dispute. Uh, Domenico AG versus controller of patents. This was uh, when Indian patent law didn't look the way it looks now. It was uh, uh, slightly different, the older version of it. Uh, so the issue was when you had vaccines which had so at that time we still didn't have drugs and food products patentable as products. Okay, You could patent their processes but you couldn't patent the the product per se. So in this case, you had a vaccine being made which could treat 
poultry uh, from some diseases and uh, the process for making that vaccine was attempted to be patented okay so the issue was uh, the, the patent office denied it saying that the process would also be patentable only when the end product can be called as manufacture or substance or composition of matter or something like that whereas a life form can't be called as a product or manufacture or composition of matter or st stuff like that okay so they said process to be patentable has to result in something which can be uh, fit in in one of these words which are mentioned in law manufacture substance and subject matter like that whereas a life form uh, you know is not finding a place in any of these words so therefore your process is also not patentable but the court calcutta high court did not agree they said to decide whether in a particular case the process of manufacture involved in the invention ought to be patented or not one of the most common tests is vendibility test. This is the test given by the court. A vendible product means something which can be uh, passed on from one man to another upon transactions of purchase and sale. The dictionary meaning of the, meaning of the word manufacture does not exclude the process of preparing a vendible commodity which contains a living substance. And in a case like this where there is no statutory meaning of manufacture, the dictionary meaning must be accepted. Okay? So they said that again, like you know, there is no distinction between life form and uh, non-life a substance matter a substance per se but uh, the, the the real test is whether what is created can be sold or transacted upon in the marketplace or not okay and if you've created something like that then the process for that would also be patentable okay so uh, okay so that is what the subject matter part of uh, it was now in the indian law uh, uh, the subject matter or the novelty and non-obviousness test of patentability are not the only obstructions or obstacles biotech patents have to cross. Biotech patents uh, would often be uh, required to meet some of the some of the uh, some of the demands uh, presented by Section 3 of the Indian Patent Act. Section 3, which in its heading says uh, 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 inventions not patentable. Okay. Uh, so it, it prescribes a list of things which would not be considered for patent protection even though otherwise it might meet patentability requirements. It would simply, if it is covered by any of these clauses, it would simply not be evaluated for any of its other possible characteristics of patentability. Okay. So some of those positions I am highlighting here. Uh, Section 3B which says against public order, morality, prejudicial to life, health and environment. Uh, so. Uh, what is prejudicial to public sorry what is against morality what is against public order what is uh, prejudicial to life health and environment very subjective terms being used and a question can always be asked is is patent office the right place to take call on these uh, these issues okay should patent office uh, or should patent law be only concerned with the technical aspect of what you're claiming whether you what you're claiming is different from what society already had or not okay shouldn't patent office be only bothered about that and not get involved in some of these uh, problematic issues uh, but as a matter of reality patent offices do get involved into these issues let me just highlight the two cases one of those cases again onco mouse so the issue uh, so onco mouse got uh, you know, got uh, litigated in various jurisdictions, and this is about uh, the European Patent Office, how they responded to it. Uh, the issue was whether creating a genetically modified organism which has predisposition towards cancer and would therefore necessarily suffer some some pain and uh, and and uh, suffering uh, is that is that really something patent law should uh, should encourage or, or stuff like that? Well, EPO after a long long discussion finally came to conclusion that let's let's have a cost benefit analysis kind of an approach so if the benefits emerging out of that animal uh, outweigh the costs in term of in terms of uh, the the harm to the animal then in that case we would hold that it is a patentable subject matter okay so they said we wish sorry uh, so um, the, the latest statement is a funny statement I'll, I'll just mention that also but anyhow so on that basis they said that you know uh, it is a patentable subject matter because in this case it is towards research vis-a-vis -vis cancer uh, something which is so desperately needed himself a, a genetic engineer and he was testing the limits of this proposition uh, given by the US law uh, so he filed a patent application you can see that abstract of the application he was basically uh, you know asking for a patent on uh, a 
chimera okay and it was a real kind of a thing which we, we would imagine you know half human and half animal kind of a thing okay he is saying that if anything made by man is patentable then this is what i can i can create give me patent on this okay he wasn't serious about taking a patent for its commercial exploitation he was only uh, on one side he was only making people aware of the potential pitfalls of uh, biotech patents and on the other side he was like if if i get it i would be able to stop others from uh, from doing this and therefore i would discourage activity in this direction if i don't get it then there would be a precedent that there is some limit on anything made by man uh, is patentable right so this question also came before the us supreme court uh, sorry uh, yeah us supreme court, us patent office rather and uh, they don't really have this moral clause as a separate subject matter clause in their patent law right yet they have some moral evaluation possibility within their utility requirement okay within their utility requirement they have something called beneficial utility okay because utility otherwise is considered to be one of the easier requirements to meet most of the innovations otherwise would meet that requirement uh, pretty easily so therefore historically what you had us supreme court had done was to make it meaningful they had said that whatever is useful for the society only those things we would allow to be patented okay whatever society actually needs in terms of its utility we would allow that to happen and there is an there is an element of moral component involved in that that version of uh, you know uh, utility so therefore based on that they said sorry we would not be, society would not want such a creature and therefore that gets hit by your beneficial uh, utility uh, you know requirement and therefore not patentable so meaning thereby that even a even a jurisdiction like us which otherwise uh, relies upon the statement that anything made by man uh, is patentable has its limitations and therefore uh, apparently it's it's too hard to escape the moral side of the innovations when it comes to patenting it and therefore section 3b possibly is required to do uh, some of that task though it is surely not an easy task to do no no beneficial no so they don't have a separate subject matter clause like we have section 3d so how so they have this uh, nuns test a uh, novelty non obviousness utility in in utility part of it uh, one version of utility they had evolved was beneficial utility okay so it gets hit by that version of utility okay so uh, coming to some other parts of section 3 uh, discovery of living thing or non living substance occurring in nature myriad professor perry has already spoken so myriad they said well uh, cutting a gene or identifying a sequence and isolating an, a sequence you might involve you might have huge amount of effort being involved there huge huge amount of scientific and technological effort being involved there all that might be worthy of praise but patent law is not really geared to uh, geared to uh, you know uh, reward those kind of uh, you know uh, those kind of scientific scientific endeavors patent law is geared towards giving to society what was not in existence already and therefore an isolated gene is ultimately a gene which was there somewhere right it's not a new composition you are giving to society and therefore uh, you know it's not a patentable subject matter this changed the trend as professor perry has said because earlier it was believed that isolated gene is not really present in in that form uh, in nature okay so isolated gene is different from gene present in a composite form in the dna and therefore it is a patentable subject matter okay but this was a shift in the understanding of what what is uh, what is uh, patentable or what is not okay so this this is covered by what we mean by discovery of living or non living substance occurring in nature okay uh, nil of you have question yeah yeah so if 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 that is resu that is resulting as part of engineering you are doing okay then even if the process after you trigger it you know takes its own course but there is an intervention from your side in triggering that process right so 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 those kind of innovations if you if you just go by the language of the law discovering a discovery of living thing or non living substance occurring in nature okay it's an obstacle then that has to be crossed right so for example uh, isolating a gene for a long time was considered to be good enough to 
uh, you know, uh, surmount this ob this obstruction. Okay, but it but these are those legal terms which were or legal tests which were not necessarily meant for biotech innovations. Okay, so we are continuously struggling to make sense of what is happening in the biotech industry, which is highly innovative, highly creative, highly uh, intelligence you know driven. Okay, and some of the requirements which were otherwise created for keeping technology in general in mind. Okay, so therefore there is there would continue to be a tussle between what can be called as uh, as created by nature and what can be called as not created by nature okay uh, so 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 unless we really have a cross jurisdiction settled position of law okay it would be difficult for me to tell you whether that would be uh, uh, you know for example you saw in case of onco mouse us supreme court said it gets covered by the word manufacture and the canadian supreme court said sorry that's not the word covering it okay so uh, if you look at our own guidelines 2013 uh, given by the patent office these guidelines are not the law not the rules okay they are merely guidelines to help uh, patent examiners discretion to be uh, you know to be meaningfully driven okay uh, so they also say that products such as microorganisms nucleic acid sequences proteins enzymes compounds which are directly isolated from nature are not patentable subject matter okay uh, but as a matter of fact in the past the indian patent office has given patents to uh, to gene sequences which are isolated from nature and and, and there's no real uh, no real change being done in them okay uh, so i am doing a little quickly because i realize that uh, we are running short of time okay uh, so section 3d discovery of a new form of known substance which does not result in enhancement of its efficacy so if it, if you have an amorphous form of a protein or something and its crystalline form is attempted to be uh, monopolized unless you show enhanced efficacy the meaning of enhanced efficacy was given by the indian supreme court in novartis okay you would not be able to patent it mere admixture resulting only in the aggregation of properties or a method of making such an uh, admixture uh, if you look at our guidelines examples are given there but a more simpler example is funk brothers versus callo inoculant where two or more than two bacteria were brought together okay uh, in a way presented as a package and uh, bacteria had this capacity of uh, you know taking nitrogen to the soil and therefore helping the plants uh, but uh, and and farmers were using bacteria for for the same purpose but all bacteria would not be you know useful for all the plants and some bacteria might inhibit each other okay and therefore uh, combining them to get, together was not seen uh, to be a, a viable proposition but these scientists figured out or found out that there are some bacteria which do not really inhibit each other and you can and you can create a kind of a compo composite form of them present them as one package and farmers can continue to use them on on various crops okay so whether that is patentable or not uh, that is what this particular section says is not patentable and that is what the court also said uh, the court held that the composition was not patent eligible because patent holder did not alter the bacteria in any way both bacteria were doing their own job separately okay they weren't really uh, they, there was no real synergy being built between the two bacteria to to give you a new result okay both bacteria were working separately it's like you know i have an umbrella and uh, i attach uh, let's say a torch on top of it and torch has a separate button umbrella has its own mechanism whenever i want to use umbrella with the torch i separately switch on the torch okay that kind of coming together of two integers or integers is not really a patentable subject matter similarly in this case also these bacteria were held to any method of agriculture or horticulture this is one example again in our own uh, 2013 policy given a method of growing leguminous plants as intercropping for improving fertility of soil for, uh, by augmenting nitrogen content of the soil the subject matter of the claim is agricultural method and hence falls within section 3h so no agricultural or horticultural method however innovative that might be is uh, protectable under the law okay uh, act any process for medical surgical curative prophylactic diagnostic therapeutic or other treatment of human beings not possible so in myriad for example though the isolated genes were held to be not uh, protectable yet using those genes for certain kind of medical procedures was uh, an open proposition you could patent that if you if if you've created something like that but under the indian law you would not be able to do that because your medical surgical and all these kind of diagnostic therapeutic treatments are not allowed to be uh, patent so this is the example i would not read that here plants or animals in whole or any part thereof other than microorganisms but including seeds varieties and species and essential biological processes for the production or propagation of plants are not patentable inventions 
why are they not patentable you can i mean if you can have a new bacteria you can have a new plant also so if a new bacteria is patentable your new plant can also be patentable well from international perspective as professor perry was also highlighting towards this uh, trips requires in 27.3 that uh, there is a flexibility afforded to you that when it comes to plants and animals you may decide not to give them patents but when when it comes to varieties of plants well you better protect them one way or the other okay so either you give them patent protection or you devise a new law uh, which is protecting them uh, somehow uh, the word is it should be efficiently protecting uh, the subject matter so we have decided not to use patent law to protect plants we have our own law called uh, prevention uh, sorry plants protection variety and farmers rights act 2001 uh just few comments about this uh, obviously i can't go into the details so so when trips says that you can't or or you need not uh, give patents to plants okay but you need to protect them somehow and you need to protect them uh, with sufficient efficacy okay uh, or sufficiently uh, there is an alternative model available in the international framework that is called upov some of you i'm very sure are aware of this okay upov okay which in english translation stands for union for the protection of new newly developed varieties or something like that okay so upov model was there and it was presumed by some that uh, upov is the by default model when somebody decides not to protect plants through patent protection they would invariably be required to protect it through upov model okay which again some of the developing countries like india did not really agree with that proposition because upov model was also developed keeping a uh, mechanized industrialized farming on big farmlands in mind and not really keeping the indian subsistence farming in mind okay so the requirements of upov model are driven towards standardized agriculture and not really towards uh, agriculture which is uh, done by uh, our farmers in countries like india pakistan etc etc so therefore we decided to have our own model and unique feature of this model just to quick, quickly highlight is that it rec recognizes the on field farmer also as as an innovator okay it gives that space to the farmer and 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 also uh, continues to preserve some of the traditional practices the farmers in india have 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 uh, depended upon uh, more particularly availability of seed okay so in india even today the greatest or the uh, the, 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 the 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 seed availability to great extent is done through what is called as over the fence transactions okay your neighbor gives you some seeds or sells it to you gifts it to you or whatever okay so that is how most of our farmers even today you know depend upon when it comes to uh, getting the seed okay they they grow the crop harvest it some of it uh, gets converted into seed they use it or they give it to their uh, neighbors or whatever okay so so this act preserves that but that possibility for our farmers it preserves it in various kinds first not only non commercial kind of transaction but even if you have to sell that seed you are allowed to sell that seed with the only condition that you won't use the branded name of of a particular company whose seed you had initially used in developing your crop okay so if you had used used monsanto seed you would not use that name because that would obviously amount to passing off but you could surely see uh, sell the seed which is there one more important factor which needs to be highlighted here is when it comes to plants and biotechnology the greatest threat to plants being protected by law, uh, plants being protected as somebody's property is not really that people uh, you know uh, is not really the absence of law okay that is surely that would surely be one of the requirements for you to protect your plant variety as an innovator but the greatest threat is the self replicating nature of the subject matter right so if i have purchased your patented seed and i sow those seeds next time i will get seeds out of the crop i had sown right and i could simply continue using that without really coming back to you ever right so this self replicating nature of the subject matter is possibly the greatest obstacle for conversion of a seed into a form of a property okay and law only goes uh, so far to help you because uh, if somebody is not following that you'll have to chase people uh, in all nooks and corners of the country to see who's not coming back to you for purchasing the seed and who's just simply re-sowing it right so therefore uh, what com companies biotech companies started doing is what what in the area of copyright law we've seen you know uh, the deployment of digital locks on on the digital uh, you know uh, digitally available subject matter similarly here you had biological locks in the form of terminator technology where the seed will not give you the seed back 
it will give you the crop but that crop will not have a seed in it okay so you cannot use any of the grain which you are getting as a seed you will have to again go back to the company and purchase it so the indian law prohibits that technology from being protected under the uh, uh, prote uh, plant variety protection and farmers rights act okay so you can't really protect a uh, terminator seed technology under this act okay uh, so quickly last few points i think an invention which in effect is traditional knowledge or which is an aggregation or duplication of known properties of traditionally known component or components is not a patentable subject matter so you have a uh, specific guidelines issued by ipo vis-a-vis uh, -vis traditional knowledge most of those guidelines are merely clarifying what would be a novel invention and what would be a non obvious improvement over what was known as part of traditional knowledge uh, the more important part of uh, the the interaction between traditional knowledge and uh, you know biotech patents is section 10 of the patent act and section 61 of the biodiversity act because section 61 of the biodiversity act requires that if you access any biological source from india and if you if you develop any product out of that pay, seeking any kind of intellectual property monopoly on that you need to first uh, inform the biodiversity authority okay uh, section 10 of the patent act therefore complements that requirement by by seeking a disclosure in your patent application vis-a-vis -vis any material bio, biological material which you have accessed from india okay if that disclosure is missing or if there is a wrong disclosure then you would not be able to secure a patent so there is this complementarity between the biodiversity act which uh, intends to ensure that india's biodiversity diversity per se and more particularly biodiversity preserved by traditional communities through their traditional grooming and all that okay does not get misappropriated uh, or does not go unacknowledged by people simply coming and taking it away and developing products out of it okay so uh, one last point i think uh, is the utility requirement as i said utility requirement for most of the other forms of technology is probably one of the simpler things to just uh, meet and patent office might not even look at whether the invention you are seeking patent for is useful or not because it would be presumed that it is useful but utility requirement becomes critical more particularly in the case of biotech patents okay because in biotech patents you might as i said as a field of science and technology it is still uh, emerging and people are people are still you know trying to figure out how best can we use various kinds of things we find out right so therefore you see the guidelines the specification should disclose the usefulness and industrial applicability of an invention in a distinct and credible manner unless the usefulness and the industrial applicability of the invention is already established okay so if you have a gene or a gene sequence or what is called as the uh, expressed sequence tag which is a portion of a gene which you can use for uh, you as a probe to find out mutations in genes okay if you have identified an expressed sequence tag okay and you roughly know that it might be helpful to finding out certain kind of mutations in the gene but you haven't still still figured out what kind of mutation you intend to find out with this particular kind of tool okay patent office would not really uh, give you a protection on that because that would be seen as still a raw form of research something which is surely worthy of being appreciated but surely in terms of legal protection that would be considered to be at a raw stage and not really at a completed stage brenner versus manson Man manson is a is a is a us authority on this not on genes per se but on chemicals okay so this was a patent for a process to manufacture a chemical uh, but this chemical compound its utility wasn't really known they roughly knew that its close relatives were being investigated for some anti tumor properties okay that rough idea they had but they weren't really sure about what this particular chemical compound would be used for they were anticipating that this would also be eventually used for the same kind of stuff but they weren't really sure okay uh, and the patent office said that a patent is not a hunting license it is not a reward for the search but compensation for its successful conclusion there was a minority opinion here also which did not agree with this it, there was a strong disagreement uh, but anyhow the majority said that uh, it's not a hunting license you finish your task and you get your patent not otherwise so utility becomes one area of patent law where the courts can make this policy driven determination to figure out whether something needs to be protected by a patent law or not whether something is little too upstream uh, in terms of research to be protected or whether something has been sufficiently developed for it to be uh, protected in favor of the uh, innovator okay so indian guidelines also say the same in the context of gene sequences it may be said that whatever ingenuity is involved in discovering a gene sequence one cannot have a patent for it or a protein encoded by it unless it is disclosed how it can be used okay so with this i think i would be closing
I obviously haven't really uh, covered all aspects of it, but whatever little I think uh, I thought I could cover, that is what I have presented. Uh, if any questions, I'm more than willing to answer those questions. I understand you are really, you know. OK, fine. So I presume no questions. So we close today's. Uh Okay, so I'm not carrying my register, so you'll have to tell me your year and roll number, okay? And some of you have come very, very late. I saw that. Uh, so please identify that you came late, and I'll mark you only for one class, okay? Otherwise, also, I know, so I just, uh, I'm just telling you. Okay, uh, so if we can start from Vanilla. Tell me the year and the roll number. 41, yes. Uh, year and roll number. 2014 and 15. Yes. Zero eight. Zero seven. Fourteen twenty six. Twenty fourteen. Fifty seven. Forty one. Twenty eight. Fifty two. Okay. Yeah. Sixty. Okay. Yes. Huh? Zero one one okay, ah, huh. forty five okay, three zero, yes, Nila, thirty two.